Uh, it's eight o'clock and um, I'm, um, I'm about to start. So I hope that you can all see uh, my screen. Um, tonight we are talking about the journey east and uh, tonight is part two of, uh, of our talk on Ashkenazi Jewish history. Um, tonight we're talking about in the lands of Poland, Lithuania and Ukraine. You're going to have to excuse me if I say the Ukraine every now and then because I, I think my whole life I said the Ukraine and um, a few nights ago I thought, am I supposed to say the Ukraine or Ukraine? And I looked it up and it's Ukraine. So if, if there's a few slips, please, please excuse me. Um, I, I didn't mean to slip along the way. Um, right, so uh, just, just to um, summarize a little bit uh, of what we did last week. Um, we, we spoke about the Jews in the Middle Ages, in the lands of Ashkenaz, in the lands of Germany and of France. And I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Um, in, the, in the lands of Germany and of France. And, um, and what exactly brought the Jews um, away from those lands? So that, that, those were the traditional lands of Ashkenaz. That's, uh, that's where Ashkenazi Jewry started. And last week we spoke about all the, um, as we spoke about the amazing rabbis of that time. Um, and then we also discussed towards the end of the talk exactly what started to happen in those areas um, that caused the decline of Jewry there and um, the destruction of many um, Jewish people and why they would um, have wanted to leave the area and journey out uh, somewhere else. So, of course, we want to know why the Jews went went east. Uh, initially, initially, I was when I was looking to do a talk, I was thinking I might do a three week series um, just on on the Jews of Poland and Lithuania, uh, and and even a three week series honestly wouldn't wouldn't do this topic justice. So, really, to um, to to be to be talking uh, in one night on such a gigantic absolutely gigantic subject. I, I, I'm going to summarize everything. Almost every single slide would, would be an entire talk or series of talks in itself. So, so please um, uh, understand that everything is really very summarized tonight. So I just want to give you a big picture of what it was like to live um, out, out in the lands of Poland, Lithuania, and Ukraine, um, and um, and, and get some idea of what it was like for Jews there. The majority of Ashkenazi Jews in the world today are from those regions. Um, many of us can trace our ancestry back now already, just a few generations ago, to Poland or, or to Lithuania or, or Ukraine, um, to what we call the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's interesting for us to know, you know where we come from. So why did, why did the Jews move out east? Why did they go to these lands? Um, basically, once the Crusades started in 1096, um, the, Jews, the lives for Jews in Ashkenaz really changed very, very dramatically. There was a massive destruction of Jewish communities in the Rhinelands, which was the traditional homeland of Ashkenazi Jewry. Um, and um, and anti-Semitism really, as we discussed last week, started to take a whole new form. Um, there were blood libels where Jews were accused of killing Jew, um, Christian children and using their blood um, to make matzah. There were Jews that were um, accused of um, um, all sorts of different things. There was a, a, a lot of um, ideas about the Yudin Sao started to come along. The Jews were accused of doing really at atrocious, awful things and hatred of Jews became something that was very common in the lands um, of Ashkenaz, especially in Germany. Um, and so, I guess anti-Semitism, the massacres of the Crusades, uh, made Jews start to look for new pastures, greener pastures. And greener pastures, there were. So, let's look at the screen. And um, I'm going to share it. And we're going to look at where Jews went. Okay, so, right, I showed you this map at the end of the, at the end of the last session, and this was really the traditional land here in Germany, those were the traditional Rhine lands um, where Jews lived, and you can see those dates. Um, Jews started to move east from straight after the Crusades, from 1096, 
um, and even a little bit earlier um, in 1012 to Poznan. Um, but generally, we're seeing Jews move right across um, to the east from, from 1096 all the way through to the late 1400s, early 1500s. Um, Jews were actually invited to move into the lands of Poland and Lithuania. And um, the reasons were, were actually quite extensive. Firstly, the Mongol invasions had come in the 1200s, and that had really destroyed a lot of the towns and villages um, in what was then Poland and, and Lithuania. And the kings of the country needed, uh, Lithuania was a duchy, it wasn't a, it wasn't a kingdom, but they needed the towns to be resettled and really they needed people that were very good with business and, um, and money. And so the Jews, uh, actually German citizens were also invited to come across as well as German, German people were used to living in towns and villages and they were used to commerce as well. But the Jews were definitely invited into Poland and then a little bit later into Lithuania. Um, initially, um, we can see that the Jews went into, Kal to, into Kalish in 1248. Uh, in, in 1264, um, Duke Boleslav, so you're going to again, please um, excuse the pronunciation of some of my names. I, I hope that I'm getting them right, but just in case I'm not, um, Duke Boleslav the, the fifth. Um, granted, um, granted Jews a whole series of rights. It was called the Statute of Kalish. And in the statute, um, I mean, Jews that had been living in Ashkenaz had no rights, really, at that time, uh, or very, very few rights. But um, in Poland, there, were, there was a whole statute where Jews were permitted to live. They were uh, granted safety. Um, if you ever get to look at, I was hoping tonight to read through some of them, but my talk will just be too long and I won't be able to. So if you do get to look at the Statute of Kalish, um, it's, it's, um, it's really incredible to see what rights Jews were actually given um, in, in Poland. Um, so that's Duke Boleslav V. And then King Casimir the Great, he was and King Casimir III. Poland was already now a kingdom in 1334. Um, and uh, Casimir... Uh, ratified the statute and Jews were given more and more um, freedoms. Uh, they were just expected to behave as good citizens, but, uh, and, and they, of course there were a, um, a lot of expectations of them to raise the economy, um, but they were essentially very well protected by the state. And then Lithuania, which really developed a bit later than Poland, um, invited Jews there too. And the Grand Duke, because Lithuania, as I said before, was not a kingdom, it was a, it was a duchy, a Grand Duke duchy. The Grand Duke um, Vitatus invited Jews to come there too. And in 1338, he made his own statute, um, giving Jews um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of rights and safety. So it was not just rights, it was protection as well, protection from the king. Um, Christian people were not allowed to beat up Jews um, Jews essentially had autonomy of, of government. Um, they were expected to, as I said before, behave well, but they were governed by themselves and, and certainly protected by the king. Um, the, for the Jews, um, living in Poland um, became a, a safety haven. They, they're actually called Polin, Polin. Um, Poland, which means, um, so it was either called Polin or Polinia. When it was called Polin, it was, uh, it was as though, here we shall rest, okay, rest here, Polin. And, um, and they really took it as, as a place where they would sojourn for a long time on, on their journey. Um, and as I said before, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily a, a fancy place to live, but, but it was a safe a good place to live. And there wasn't the anti-Semitism there at all that there had been um, in, in the lands of Germany. Not at all. So when we think, uh, you know, Second World War stuff, this, this just really didn't exist um, in the early phases uh, or early in the Middle Ages in Poland. So we're talking really high Middle Ages now. Um, Vilna was called the Jerusalem of Lithuania. I mean, Jews were very, very well settled in these countries. Um, really from the 1200s all the way through 
and, and they were there until the 20th century. I mean, there are, of course, still Jews in Lithuania and Poland and, and Ukraine. But, um, but obviously the Holocaust um, and um, the Holocaust destroyed the majority of the communities, which we will talk about a little bit later, maybe not in this talk, but in, in, the, following, in the following talk. Um, okay, so um, in, in, 15, um, in 1569, in 1569, Poland and Lithuania joined, and they became the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So you can see a long period of time, 1569 to 1795, um, it was called the Union of Lublin, and as you can see, if you look at that map, it was by far the biggest country in Europe. So it wasn't such a strong country politically. Uh, it, was, it was loosely bound. Um, it, was, it was fairly weak, but it was massive. The, the land tracts in this country were absolutely huge. Um, and during the time of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in general, uh, other, uh, other than towards the end of that, uh, which will absolutely be the topic of, of tonight's talk, um, the life in life in that area was was generally good. It was certainly good for a good 300 to 350 years. Um, what did what did Jews do in this area? So we know that when they were in Germany, Jews were essentially involved in um, in money lending um, and uh, in 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 trade uh, in business. Whereas in, um, in Poland, Lithuania, so sometimes I'll, I'll call it the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, sometimes I'm going to call it Poland, and sometimes I'm going to call it Lithuania, it's all one area that I'm talking about. Um, what, what, what Jews did really there was um, a, a, a mix of things. Try not to think of like Fiddler on the Roof, because that's much later in the plan of settlement. Let's talk about Middle Ages, um, to how Middle Ages, to Renaissance, times and even and even beyond so um what basically what uh what happened was um jews were involved in land leasing so now do you remember last week i discussed that the jews were not in the feudal system in western europe but in eastern europe they actually were sort of a part of the feudal system which gave them some protection um but they were not serfs and they were not nobility they sort of fell between serfs and nobility, they were like the middlemen between serfs and nobility and they leased land from the nobles and, and looked after that land and leased that land out. So much of what they were doing was land leasing um, and tax farming and um, it, it produced them uh, a decent living. Uh, there were of course Jews living on the land as well and they were leasing from other Jews too um and generally land is being leased from the high polish nobility so there was a high nobility called the higher schlachter and then there were the lower nobility the lower schlachter in general jews were um very well uh what were dealing very very closely with the upper with the high schlachter the high nobility um because they were the big land owners um uh, so this this um, this area that we're looking at here, basically Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, Poland, these had giant tracts of land that were owned by the king, owned by the church, and owned by nobility. And Jews would live in towns in these areas, um, that like a town on an estate, and those were many of them became majority Jewish towns. Um, Jews actually didn't live in Russia, uh, what we know as Imperial Russia, um, from the late 1400s. They were checked at Moscow. Um, so Jewish expansion actually never moved further than Moscow until very, very much later. Um, and um, the, the uh, Russians were actually, uh, there was a whole conspiracy. They were very, very scared of having Jews there. So they never actually allowed Jews in. When Jews say that they're from from Russia is talking about much later on than, than this period that we're talking about now. Um, was there anti-Semitism from the Polish church? Well, this was a, um, um, a Catholic land, uh, absolutely a Catholic land. And um, yes, there was anti-Semitism from the Polish church, from the Catholic church. 
but there were lots of different ethnicities living in this giant uh, area. And so it was, whilst there were small events, it wasn't, um, it wasn't on an, organ, an organized scale at all, like it had been in Western Europe. Um, and anti-Semitism from the church itself. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what life was like in Poland. Okay, so do you remember I said Jews were essentially governed themselves? So of course they were answerable to the king and they were answerable to nobility, but they were essentially run by the kahal. Okay, so if we think of ourselves, a, a community is, um, I'll, I'll stop sharing for a second. Um, the, a community now, we still call a kahila, right? Because we, we are a, a community. Um, and the Jews in each town were a community. They were a kahila. They were run by the kahal. So who was the kahal? It was generally um, the very wealthy people in the area, uh, in, in the town. And they, they were in charge of running the community. So you paid your tax to the kahal. Um, you, the kahal ran the shul, they ran the mikvah, they made sure that um, shrita was happening in the town, um, they made sure that the Jews were behaving themselves very well, um, they would, um, someone, oh, I can't see you. Oh, you can't see me? Oh dear, okay, uh, that's strange, sorry, my husband was just there, uh, I'm wondering how to actually fix this, um, can can people see me? You can? Yes? Okay. Only my husband can't. <laughs> That's it. He sees me the rest of the time. He probably doesn't want to see me. <laughs> okay. I'm glad you can see me. He sees a screen in front of him that says Zoom. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so, yeah, so the, the people that were in charge of the cow were the the wealthy people in the town, um, and essentially, thanks. Um, essentially, uh, because they they were the wealthy people, they they ran the kahal. The lower people, um, the the less wealthy people, had less um, had less say in what happened, but they just had to behave themselves. So, some someone last week actually asked me who would um, if interest if, if there was anyone sort of regulating how much interest was charged on um, to, to non-Jewish people. And um, in, in Poland, Lithuania, the Kahal was actually in charge of that. So they would say, yes, you can charge interest, but this is how much interest you can charge. Or um, this is how much you can lease land for. So J Jews were definitely subject to the Kahal for civil matters um, and for religious matters. Now, what happened if you were living in a town uh, where one kahal said something and then you move to another town and another kahal said something. Basically, the kahal often disagreed. And, um, and so to stop this disagreement between different uh, kahals, um, a very large body was created, huge body that met twice a year in spring in Lublin um, and then also, also in autumn later on um, called the Council of Four Lands. And in Lithuania, there was the Council of, um, of um, Lithuania as well. So uh, they, they were called Vaad Arbaratsot, Council of Four Lands in Poland and Ukraine. Um, and in Lithuania, um, it was called Vaad Medinaklita. So the, the council actually was in charge of the Kahal. So they, they were subject to the, the council. The people that um, were on the council were called the Paranasim. I guess it's like Parnassa. You know, if, if you had a lot of money, you had a chance of being one of the Parnassians. And they essentially made all the rules um, that the Jews in Poland and Lithuania had to live by, obviously under, you know, under king and nobility. But, um, but in terms of Jewish life and in terms of civil life and in terms of your taxes, you paid your taxes to the council. Uh, so to the kahal, the kahal paid the council and the council gave it to the king. So Jews were really run by an, an autonomous body um, and, and because of that had so much uh, independence and um, compared to living in compared to living in Western Europe where Jews had almost no rights and, and almost no autonomy. Um, okay so I'll stop sharing for a second and uh,
in a moment. You can see my screen. Um, also, uh, another thing that was important was language. So Jews um, in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth were all connected by the same language, by Yiddish. So um, Yiddish developed over the years, um, originally from high, high German um, and Hebrew and Aramaic. And of course, um, there's two, two main types of Yiddish. There's Western and, and Eastern Oriental Yiddish. Um, when we're hearing Yiddish today, most people are speaking Eastern Yiddish. Um, but Yiddish really incorporated a lot of Slavic words because it was um, in Slavic speaking countries. And, um, and, and this language, I guess, um, connected all Jewish communities. Um, Yiddish was spoken amongst all the communities and it also was very good for connecting in business because you could, you could speak to other Jews and not everyone understood what you, what you were uh, talking about um, at the time. Um, also quite important, um, just on language, to, to note that um, many Sephardim had also started to come to these lands after the expulsion from, from Spain and from Portugal. So after 1492, we have not only original Ashkenazim from the Rhinelands coming into, um, into these areas, but we also have um, we also have some Sephardim starting to come in. Of course, they had gone to the Ottoman Empire, many of them, and then once the um, after 1453, we have the Ottoman Empire, and they started to do a lot of business with southern Poland. Um, and so now you've got Jews that can um, communicate with each other uh, very well, because these Sephardim, of course, could also also learn to speak Yiddish. And so business was really um, very well connected then between the Ottoman Empire and Poland in terms of uh, Ladino speaking Jews and Yiddish speaking Jews all managed to somehow do, um, do business together and, and have a whole international operation um, happening there. So there were definitely some Sephardim, I should mention, um, that, came, um, that came and then mixed into Ashkenazi culture. Most of them became um, mixed in very easily and became Ashkenazi within two or three generations. But of course, there were still Sephardim that kept their identity and still had their identity all the way until, um, until the time of the Holocaust. Um, Jews were living in a shtetl. Shtetl is essentially uh, a little town, um, a little town where mostly where Jews were living. Um, there were, of course, some non-Jewish people also living in some of these towns, but the majority of, uh, if, there was a, if they had a majority of Jewish population, it's called the shtetl. And these little shtetls were on these great land estates, um, these great latifundium, or latifundia, um, in, uh, in Lithuania, in, in Poland, and of course in Ukraine. Um, were there ghettos? Not really. So, so ghettos were really a Western European thing, it started in 1517 in Venice. Um, but um, there were, of course, Jewish quarters. So a lot of the towns that um, had a, a large Jewish population had a Jewish quarter, but you weren't restricted to living there um, by a wall or by a curfew. It's just generally Jews chose to live in those areas because that was where their cleaner was. That was where the community was, and that was where all the kosher food was, and the mikvah and the shul. So, you know, that's where, that's where they were going to hang out. But there, were, there weren't uh, curfews or walls or restrictions, certainly not, not in this time. Um, and, then, and then yeshivas. Yeshivas were a, a really big deal. So uh, initially, um, initially in, uh, if you wanted anyone of any sort of scholarly standing, you would have to go and get your rabbi from Germany or from Bohemia, from Prague. Um, but after some time, um, it, it, it sort of the tides changed and Poland really became the place you would get your rabbi from. So if you wanted a good, well-learned rabbi, you, you got the rabbi from Poland. Um, and then they would then move to Bohemia or to Germany or to France or wherever, um, wherever people needed a rabbi from. So the Yitzhak Shivas are not um, in the early phases. This is not the same as the yeshiva system that then developed in the 1800s. Um, the yeshiva system we know that developed in Lithuania, that uh, we, we still use that sort of similar yeshiva system today. Um, but the, these were essentially um, learning centers that were established in Lublin and um, in Krakow, in Krakow, 
um, that were um, had a, a very specific Polish way of learning. That there were people who were generally quite well learned, um, uh, but in in the shivers. So I mean, you went to school like was essentially you know primary school, and if you were intelligent and scholarly, then you would then continue on uh, at the yeshiva. And the first like really sort of big yeshiva that was established in Lublin was a uh, Rabbi Yaakov Pollock, um, Pollock like Polish, uh, and and he established the system called Pilpul. So um, Pilpul is sort of like a convoluted way of of learning Talmud. You'd say, well, if, you know, if that equals that, and that equals that, and then you could bring an example from something else, and that equals that, and then eventually you come up with this uh, sort of like loose um, conclusion. And it was mind-bending and mind-twisting uh, and, and really good for the intellect, but you might come up with uh, an answer that was sort of like a weak answer. Um, and so there were a lot of opponents to the system of Pilku, but this was really developed in, in Poland and, um, and again for yeshiva students a, a really, you know, um, a, a very good intellect, if not very good conclusion uh, at the end of it. Um, the rabbi that we know of that is really um, the, the most probably famous rabbi of this era um, in, in Ash, for Ashkenazim was uh, Rabbi Moshe Izzelers. So he was called the Rema. Um, you can see those dates, 1530 to 1572. And he established a yeshiva in Krakow. He actually had learned at the yeshiva that Rabbi Pollock started. Um, and, uh, and he established his own yeshiva in Krakow. He was a very apparently very uh, humble, uh, good man. Um, I've actually been to the cemetery in, in Krakow, in Krakow, uh, and, and seen his tombstone. So when I was having a look at pictures, it was quite amazing to, to find this one. Um, Krakow's the most beautiful, uh, beautiful old city, stunning. One of the only ones that wasn't destroyed by the Nazis. Um, and um, he was, he had this yeshiva there. Now, he did an amazing thing, and this really makes a very big difference to understand how Polish Jewry and Sparadi, so Ashkenazi Jewry and Sparadi Jewry, really managed to somehow unite. They had a chance to really split up big time in terms of halakha, but because of Rabbi Moshe Izzelin, um, they didn't. So Rabbi Yosef Karo uh, in Sfat wrote the Shulchan Aruch, uh, which was the code of Jewish law, and that's how we know what laws we have to follow. Now, if you just have to look in the Talmud, it's, it's quite difficult or very difficult to find uh, exactly how you're supposed to do a particular halakha. Um, you, you've got to look very, very carefully and be very well learned. If you are using a code, um, it's much easier to find which, um, you know, what exactly you're supposed to do with halakha. So what uh, Rabbi Moshe Izzelers did is he used the Shulchan Aruch and he wrote little editions in the Shulchan Aruch for Ashkenazim, so that the Jews in Poland and Lithuania and Ukraine would then know, okay, that's the law, and this is the special custom that we do um, that makes it part of our law as well, so that all Jews have the same code, um, just Ashkenazim have specific customs that are particular to Ashkenazim. And he wrote, he called it Hamakha, the tablecloth. So Shulchan Aruch is the set table, and uh, Hamapa is, is the tablecloth that goes on top. Okay. Um, all right. Now, so this is, the, this is the good bit that I've been talking about, and uh, all good things come to an end. Um, and so next thing we're going to be talking about, I'm going to show you the slide, is the beginning of the end. Um, and uh, we're going to talk now about the Tat the Tat the, the um, Hamel Niski, and I always have trouble pronouncing it, I actually say it over and over and over so that I can actually say it right. When you look at that word, it does not look like Hamel Niski, but that is how it's pronounced. Um, massacres of 1648 to 1649, what we know in Jewish history as Tach Tat. And life, as I said before, in Poland uh, and Lithuania and Ukraine had been good for Jews. But after this period, Things really change, really, really, really change. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing for a second and I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Hope you can see me. <laughs> yeah, you can see. Okay, very good.
I'm scared every time I start sharing, <laughs> then we disappear. Um, okay, so let's talk about this. This is very, this is this is really like where everything changed for for actually the whole Polish Lithuanian Lithuanian Commonwealth, and but especially for Jews in the area. So do you remember I spoke to you about these huge land tracts that the Polish nobility had? You have to understand that these land tracts were giant. And remember who were the leaseholders? Who was holding the lease for these land tracts? The Jews. Okay. And who was living on the land tracts? Serfs. Now, um, in the feudal system, you've got the king, the nobility. In the Polish system, you've got then the Jews. And then you've got the serfs down at the bottom. Now, especially in Ukraine, especially in Ukraine, you had these giant tracts of land called Latifundia. And Jews owned, the Jews owned the lease. And it was called the arranger system. I hope I'm not giving too many words. So Latifundia, big pieces of land. Arranger system was where the Jews owned the lease of the land. The Polish nobility were absent. They were still living in their castles in Poland. Jews went to go and live in Ukraine, especially um, in the new colonized areas once the um, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth came along, they colonized a lot of the Ukraine. Um, and once they colonized the Ukraine, you, you have these huge big land tracts where there's no nobility living on them, but there's Jews that are administering them. Um, and serfs living on the land. Now, who's got to collect the money from the serfs? The Jews. Who has to control what happens with the serfs? The, the Jews. The Jews are in charge of what's happening on these giant tracts of land, difficult to manage. Um, they're hoping to make some money out of this as well. Uh, they leased uh, land to um, also to taverns and to inns, and they were heavily involved in the alcohol business. Um, and living on this land with serfs who are very, very poor. Now, um, there were also a lot of the people living in Ukraine were actually Russian Orthodox. Um, and the owners of the land are Catholic. So you've got a religious differential happening there, and you've also got um, a money differential. So once you've got serfs that are very poor, if they need to pay taxes, they're having to pay to the Jews. Um, and, and they had very little money, like serfs were extremely poor, and the Jews were the ones that were, had been left with the responsibility of getting, collecting the money from serfs. So if you were a serf and you were not very happy, who would you be angry with? For sure, the Jews, because that was the person that you were coming into contact with. You hated the Polish nobility, that's really, you really did hate them, but you never saw them. You, you saw the Jews first. So if you're going to be angry with someone and you're going to come into contact with uh, someone, it's going to be the Jews who cut the problems first. And there was a lot of anger that had been brewing amongst the people in, amongst the serf population in Ukraine, especially on the eastern side of the Dnieper River, um, where people were definitely Russian Orthodox, there were not Catholics living there. Um, and these were really frontier areas. And uh, the Cossacks, you've heard of the Cossacks? You can see a lot of nods there. So the Cossacks really came from this area, east of the Dnieper. And um, the Dnieper River um, sort of split Ukraine into, into the area where the, the big Latifundia were and the, the real sort of like frontier uh, towns and villages were. And it was also sort of a, 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 a Russian Orthodox and Catholic split. So the, the Cossacks were really living on the, on the eastern banks of the, of the Nipper River. Uh, very angry, very, um, uh, there were, I mean, they were generally you know, highwaymen and uh, and uh, uh, many uh, sort of uh, serfs who were disillusioned or dispossessed um, had had a, had anyway a very tough life, but they were rough, very rough people. And uh, eventually, they got a leader by the name of Bogdan Khmelnytsky. Uh, Khmelnytsky, told you I have trouble saying this word. Bogdan Khmelnytsky. Um, and he managed to band them together and they started massacring the first people they came across that they were angry with and that started with the Jews. So they would go from town to town 
literally like the worst atrocities that you can actually imagine. Um, I, I can't even talk about them on screen because I just actually can't. But um, if you want to read about them, you, you can. But uh, atrocious, atrocious atrocities, it wasn't just murder. Um, and they went literally from town to town. So they, they, would, um, they went all the way from Ukraine all the way through into southern Poland. And then a couple of years later, they went north into Lithuania as well. They were after Jews, but they were also after the Polish clergy, the Catholic priests, uh, nuns, and some Polish nobles suffered terribly um, at the hands of the Cossacks um, under, under Khmelnytsky, who was then regarded as a hero in, in Ukraine. He was the one that liberated the serfs and the peasants. Um, and, and for Jews, like this was, it was a, a most atrocious period and set in motion uh, just about everything that then happened in Poland and Lithuania after this. The Polish society was ruined, Lithuanian society was ruined, Jewish society was ruined. There were Jews wandering on the roads, like with nowhere to go, with no money at all, lost half of their family. They say between 1648 and 1653, about 100,000 Jews died. Um, if not from murder, which was a, a large percentage, um, then from famine, from starvation, and just from literally not having anywhere to go. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it was, of course, you know, Poland and Lithuania and Ukraine can get very cold in winter. Um, but a shocking period, they really set in motion all sorts of things. Okay, so now we're going to see what got set in motion from, from tap to tap. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so after tuck for tight, this is what happens. Okay, hopefully I get this. Right. Okay, so we've got all these dispossessed people. Um, the interesting thing is 1648 um, and 1649 were cabalistically calculated as the years that the Messiah was going to come. So people were expecting the Shia, and instead they got these atrocious, atrocious massacres. And so it's no doubt that people were waiting for Mashiach to come. Um, they, they thought it was, this was like, this was the worst thing that happened to Jews until the Holocaust. And so they were waiting, waiting patiently for the Mashiach, but they thought he was coming that year, didn't come. And so in, um, so I guess they were, if you're waiting so hard for the Mashiach, um, uh, if someone comes around and they have false Mashiach, you may believe them. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Shabtatsky. I'm not going to go into too much detail because we could honestly have an entire talk about Shabtatsky uh, or a few talks about Shabtatsky. is very interesting. Uh, Jacob Frank, I'll touch on for two seconds, but because it happens in Poland and it's a direct result of the Sabbatean movement, uh, I'll, I'll mention him too. Uh, Shabtatsky was born, of course, in Smyrna um, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, on the Nantabav, above, okay, on Tisha above, and uh, in, in 1626, uh, he was a very charismatic man, very learned, uh, um, sort of child prodigy. People thought that he was, uh, he was a proper genius. But from, from quite a young age, um, people started to realize there was something very strange about him. He, he was sort of bordering on, on being like very odd, maybe extremely holy, which is how how sometimes in those days, um, you know, sort of a, a psychiatric problem was interpreted uh, as, as someone particularly spiritual or, you know, different. And uh, he, I mean, he was, he definitely had, he definitely had psychiatric problems. Um, but because he was so charismatic, he managed to attract people uh, from, from far and wide. And the rabbis in Smyrna, very suspicious of him and actually got rid of him um, and he landed up going from one community to the next and when he would go and talk in communities uh, he was very sort of spiritual very into Kabbalah um, not Lurianic Kabbalah which was actually the Kabbalah of the time uh, but more sort of Zohar and stuff um, and uh, very charismatic and people were looking 
for a, a follower. Never said he was Mashiach at that stage. Never said he was the Messiah. But he eventually wound up in, in Jerusalem, and a man called Nathan of Gaza heard him speak. And Nathan of Gaza managed to convince Shabbat Zvi that he was the Messiah. And of course, Shabbat Zvi, he believed it. So he, um, we'll stop Shabbat Zvi for a second. He believed he was Messiah. So um, eventually, you know, he started to um, he started to go with the flow, and he went from community to community, um, you know, uh, with all his Kabbalah. And uh, Nathan of Gaza was coming with him, and he started to tell people that yes, he is actually Mashiach. He started to change many uh, laws. Um, he said, you know, you don't need kashrut, uh, you don't need uh, laws of, of family purity. Um, he he said, oh, you don't need. You know, we no longer need Tisha B'Av, and we don't need the fast days because you know Mashiach is here. He. Um, and um, and and people actually actually believe them. So I don't know if they were just like really right for the picking at the time, um, or if he was honestly that charismatic. Um, but people, as I said before, they've been waiting for Mashiach, and here was Mashiach for them. And I, I'm seriously, people actually sold their houses. They um, they went, um, they, they sold houses, sold businesses, planned, made, made big plans to go to Israel. Uh, whole communities, entire communities were whipped up in, in a messianic uh, era. They, they were uh, very excited, very, very excited about this. And Shantar Tzvi, of course, he, he held court in Constantinople. He went back to Smyrna. He held court in Smyrna too. Uh, and he had everybody fall. Um, um, except a few rabbis who were not very happy at all with him, but they were scared to say anything. And if they did, they were really shut down by the people. And um, he he had become that popular that that uh, you know any any sort of voice of reason amongst anybody was was just not uh, listened to at all. And um, and the only person who who didn't believe him, uh, who had any say, of course, was the Sultan. Um, because when he said he's going to take Jerusalem from the Sultan, that's when the Sultan decided it was now time to intervene, they've had enough. And so he said to him, uh, basically, if you want, uh, I will not kill you, uh, if you just convert to Islam. So you can convert or you can continue to, you know, hold court here and decide that you are the, you know, the Messiah. But I can't have people say that uh, they're going to go and take Jerusalem back. So, you know, what's it going to be? And he's there was like no hesitation. Is that like, oh, okay, I'll I'll just convert to Islam. So here was here was the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, um, deciding to convert to Islam. And uh, I'll even say his uh, his name. He became Aziz Mehmet Effendi. He uh, he got lots of uh, fancy fancy titles and um, and land and great position. And um, can you actually imagine how Jews felt? Like they like sold everything and put all their hopes on this, and here their their Mashiach had converted to Islam. So the the feeling of desperation and devastation that then followed this was on. Um, I mean, there's just been tat for tat, and now in 1666 you have Shantat Tzvi. Um, and, and, and a whole bunch of people still believing that Shabbat Tzvi was still Mashiach uh, for a long time afterwards, an entire Sabbatean movement still going on for a long time after this. Um, you can just imagine, you can, the Jewish world was in tatters, absolute tatters. And, um, and then, of course, Jacob Frank came along afterwards and said, actually, yes, the Sabbatean movement is right. Um, a lot of the things that he said were right, but the only problem was, that wasn't the Mashiach, you see, you got it wrong. I am the Mashiach, my name is Jacob Frank, I am the Mashiach, uh, and he lived in Poland, and he actually managed to get 50,000 followers. 50,000 followers, it's huge, in Poland. But of course he was, uh, he was of course, not the Mashiach, and uh, not the Messiah, and he um, actually ended up converting with all his followers to Christianity. So, right, okay. <laughs> now we're just gonna go, Back. I'm just going to share the screen for a second um, because we're going to talk about something nice now. 
Okay, here we go. Okay, the rise of Hasidism. So we've had all these terrible things happening and we've got Jews poor, um, dispossessed of land, uh, living in Ukraine, living in southern Poland, devastated by the, devastated by Tachmatat, the massacres, devastated by what's just happened with Shabtatsky, and everybody is feeling really down and out. And especially, especially in southern Poland and Ukraine, but especially, especially in Ukraine. Ukraine has, Jewish Ukraine has just really not coped very well with all of these terrible things that have happened. And a man by the name of, we know him as the Baal Shem Tov, of Rabbi Yisrael ben Eliezer, born in 1698, so Tachbetach was 1648, Shabbat Tzvi 1666, 1698. Um, he comes along and, um, I mean, there's so many stories and we could honestly, again, we could, we could have an entire talk just on a few talks on Hasidism, so I'm just going to touch on this now. A lot of you know the stories. Um, the Baal Shem Tov, extremely charismatic uh, speaker, um, raised the hopes of the masses, um, uh, Jewish masses, in, especially in, in the Ukraine. And um, there I go again, the Ukraine, in Ukraine. Um, he was very spiritual. He, um, he gave people hope. Um, basically, he said, you don't need to be scholars, you don't need to be studying in yeshiva all day, you need to have spirituality, you need, to, we are all, uh, we all have sparks of holiness, um, and you should, um, you should be very involved in prayer, and you can connect to Hashem through prayer and through nature um, and through the creation. Um, and this is really what people needed to hear. They, they needed this. Um, badly, and he gave them he gave them a lot of hope. He managed to accumulate large crowds of people, um, and of course, of course, Hasidism then goes on to develop um, in in you know on a very large scale right throughout the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, he uh, the the Magid of Mezerich, Rabbi Dovber, um, then who's also very charismatic, a brilliant teacher, brilliant uh, Tal um, Talmud Chacham. He, um, he manages to really start the movement properly and, um, and teach a whole bunch of disciples that then go on to form all the different branches of, of um, Chassidot, of Chassidus, that we, that we know of, still of today. Um, rabbi um, Shnir Zaman of Liadi is the rabbi that starts Lubavitch Chabad, um, Lubavitch was the town where they were from, but Chabad is the, is the movement that he starts, um, Chachma Ben Adai, um, and he, um, uh, uh, yeah, he's living from 1745 to 1812, and this is really, that's when um, a lot of the movements really become um, very strong. Of course, Chabad um, and um, Rabbi Shneur Zalman has, has a lot of problems with um, the mid in, in Lithuania, which we are going to now talk about. So Hasidism is, is, is an entire talk on its own. I just wanted to touch on it because I wanted to show you that it wasn't all really bad. Um, after after Tach the it, it, it was economically bad and spiritually bad. There was a whole other side that, um, that then started to develop where Jews really um, found hope and um, uh, and managed to reconnect to Judaism um, big time. Okay, so um, the, we also need to talk about the Vilna Gaon. And again, we can we, we could have a whole talk on the Vilna Gaon, but he's living around at the same time, a little bit later than, um, than the Baal Shem Tov, but they are, there, there definitely is a crossover in period where they're both active. The Vilna Gaon, of course, is in Vilna in, in Lithuania, and um, Rabbi Eliyahu of Vilna, um, we have we uh, a genius like we haven't seen in 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 you know in a very long time um, since, and they hadn't seen a genius like this uh, for a very long time before um, um, you know Vilna Gaon came along. He he actually was never a rabbi of a shul or rabbi of the community, but he was so um, intelligent um, and was such a force in Vilna that um, he was sort of the undisputed 
recognized leader of the Jews, even though he never said that he was um, the leader or, or never took a, commun a, you know, a communal position. He um, uh, managed to, I mean, there's heaps of things that, that he did, but in terms of his scholarliness, um, he, he managed to take a lot of the erroneous, pluralistic interpretations of things and managed to fix it up. He took, um, uh, you know, there, there have been so many errors in copying the Gemara over, over all the years, Gemara and Mishnah, and he managed to fix those errors. He, he was extremely, extremely intelligent. Um, and, um, and actually, not only, even though he had a formal education, but not only in, in Jewish law, he was also a mathematician. Uh, he knew geometry and algebra and engineering and music. Um, and, and, but all of this was a means to study Torah. For the Vilnik on, Torah was everything. Um, and the study of Torah was everything. They say he only slept for four hours um, a, in a 24-hour cycle. Um, yep, I've I, I been, been guilty of that, but not like the Vilnik on. The Vilnik on was studying Torah all of, all of that time. Um, and, you know, every single waking hour was devoted to Torah. The only time he could think about his family or whatever was when he was in areas where he was not allowed to be studying Torah. So that was, uh, again, I said we could have a whole talk on it, but I have to move on. The midnight dim, um, he was, the midnight dim means, um, you know, the people that, um, um, they were the opponents, so the, the people that were opposing Hasid, Hasidism, um, it, it, beca it became a very, very big uh, issue in the in the lifetime of the Vilna uh, on and after him where um, there was like seriously a lot of fighting between the Mitnagdim or Misnagdim as we pronounce in Ashkenaz uh, Hebrew between the Misnagdim and the Hasid and the Hasidist, uh, Hasidism um, over a lot of things the Mitnagdim were very worried that the that um, Hasidut was a deviation from Judaism, that it was a whole new movement, a whole new religion that was starting. And of course, they were so worried after a Shabbat and the whole Sabbatean movement. They were worried with Kabbalah and mysticism that, uh, um, that it would change Judaism for good. Um, the fighting was quite bad. I mean, at some stage, they called in Russian authorities to try and sort things out between them, which, which only made things worse. It, it's never a good idea to call in. Russian authorities ever when Jews are having a fight. Um, but in the end, they managed to sort their differences um, and sort them out because a whole new movement started, the Haskalah, the Enlightenment movement started. And so they actually realized, um, the Mithagdim and the Hasidim actually realized they have a lot more in common than, than Jews who are becoming secular and throwing Judaism away. And so eventually, uh, they actually managed to get us together and, um, and, and, and have a more unified front rather than fighting each other. Of course, the Vilna Gaon then gives rise to um, and sparks, you know, sparks a whole new idea of Torah learning. And this gives rise to the Yeshiva movement, um, which was huge. And again, we could have an entire talk just on the Yeshiva movement. But Rabbi Chaim of Belajan really starts the first Yeshiva, the Belajan Yeshiva. There are many yeshivas, uh, Slobodka, Ponovich, Tulls, we, we know these names. These were the great yeshivas in Lithuania. And of course, Lithuania then in the 1800s really becomes the seat of learning. That is where the yeshivas are, that's where the scholars are coming out of. Um, and, and so Judaism takes on a whole new level of learning, of, um, of, of scholarliness. There's a whole new type of Jew that develops, the scholarly. Jew, not necessarily to become a rabbi, but just to learn for learning's sake. Um, that develops all in the 1800s um, in, um, in Lithuania specifically, rather than, rather than Poland. Um, now, I'm just going to go down here. Okay, so the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, it breaks up. Remember I told you it was quite a weak state, and it was so big, really hard to control something so big. Um, and after, of course, after those attack the attack massacres in the 1600s, the society really begins to unravel. And um, after some time, you've got these really strong powers surrounding the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. You've got Austria, 
down in the southwest, you've got Germany or Prussia, it's not Germany, Prussia in the northwest, and of course, Mother Russia, Imperial Russia, this giant, giant force um, on the east. And they start to split up the Polish Commonwealth into, they take bits of it. And so the first one starts in 1772. I don't know if you can see this picture, but they take little slices at a time um, until in 1795, they've split up the whole of Poland, Lithuania, Commonwealth and the Ukraine, and it doesn't exist anymore. It's just, it's people know it from their ethnicities, but now Poland and Lithuania um, and Ukraine are part of Russia, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and um, and the and Prussia. Um, and really, where you were as a Jew, where you were placed, made a very big difference as to how you were then going to live, um, because of course. In the West, in Prussia, um, Jews became much more enlightened. Um, if you were in the Austro-Hungarian Empire also, you were given a lot more freedoms than, of course, if you were living under Russia. Russia had not had Jews living in it for about 200 years, more, longer. Um, and now, suddenly, suddenly there were one and a half million Jews in, in Russia. And Catherine the Great, was, uh, who was the ruling monarch at the time, of Russia when they took uh, Lithu certainly Lithuania, most of Poland and, and Ukraine. Russia got the biggest slice. You can see Russia over there is, is yellow. You can see me pointing over there. Um, Russia got the biggest slice and they didn't want Jews. They didn't know what to do with Jews. Um, and so they created what was called the Pale of Settlement, which meant uh, a, an entire slice of the land where Jews were already living they already had been living there. They didn't want them to move into Russia. That entire slice of land that went all the way from Lithuania, um, all the way down to the Black Sea, in the, in, the, in a slice of two, that little bulge over there is uh, is is um, Poland, um, or what the, what Russia had of Poland. It was called Congress Poland. Um, that land became the Pale of Settlement. And the Pale of Settlement really is, when you think about Fiddler on the Roof, that's in the Pale of Settlement. Jews were very disenfranchised there. Um, they were poor. Uh, of course, they were not leaseholders anymore to large tracts of land, uh, which had been taken away from the Polish nobility. Um, they, uh, Russia encouraged Jews to be agricultural. Jews were, had never really been agricultural and were not particularly good at being agricultural either. But they learned, um, they learned, and then, you know, of course, some of the, the, the Jews that landed up moving into the agricultural areas actually landed up moving on to um, Eretz Israel afterwards and starting Kibbutzim. So they did learn something. Uh, and of course, established amazing Kibbutzim in, in, in Israel. Um, but life in the, um, in the Pale was, um, was very difficult, very, very difficult, and Jews became very, very poor. Um, and were subject to pogroms. So we, we know all about the pogroms um, that, that then follow in, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Jews were really trying to just eke, eke out a living. And, um, and, and then, of course, you know, Russia decided to recruit Jewish males into, into the army. Um, uh, we have these cantonist laws where they would recruit boys for 25 years into the Russian army and, you know, after 25 years in the army, if you, if you actually did come out alive uh, after the Russian army, you were probably not Jewish. So, um, you know, Russia really, that really, really changed what it was like for Jews living in, in the East. Um, and many Jews decided to move, make the move back west. So back west over to the old lands of, of Ashkenaz, the traditional lands of Ashkenaz back to Germany, back to France, and of course back to England, and then to America and South Africa and Australia. So we've got these mass immigrations that, that then happen um, from the 1800s onwards once, um, once it becomes very difficult to live within the pale um, of settlement and of course once, um, uh, once the Cantonist laws come out and the problems really start en masse. 
um, and, and Jews start to make their way west. And that will be uh, my talk next week, where, where we talk about the, the journey back west, back to the lands of Ashkenazi, and we'll talk about what happened to the Jews when they go west um, and the different communities that then develop. Um, there's lots more that happens in the Jewish story uh, until, you know, until, until today. Of course, there were many Jews that still played in, in Russia, um, in Ukraine, in Poland, in, in Lithuania. Uh, many, many, many Jews were, we know, six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. Those were Jews, many of those Jews, so three and a half million Jews were in Poland at the time um, that the war broke out, and there were 300,000 Jews left in Poland after the Holocaust. Um, Lithuania lost more than 95% of its population. Um, in Ukraine, one and a half million Jews were murdered in Ukraine. So there were, of course, many Jews that stayed behind. They didn't make, journey, make the journey out west. But, um, but, but those Jews, really, that did stay, had a very difficult time. Um, you know, early 1900s, right throughout the First World War, um, and then into, um, and then unfortunately, many, many Jews perished in the Holocaust. We will maybe get to discuss some of the Holocaust next week, which, which we, we, we should do. Um, but, um, but essentially, we'll be talking about the journeys where it's the enlightenment and um, how Jews made their journey um, over to the, back to the traditional lands of Ashkenaz and into uh, new, new countries like uh, America, England and, um, and, and other countries. So I hope to see you again next week. Uh, thank you so much for listening today. I hope I didn't give you too much information, but um, I was, it was lovely to have you all here uh, and uh, see you next week. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I should try and uh, let me see if I can open this up. Hang on. I'll try and unmute. Okay. Are we unmuted? Thank you very much, Bev. Uh, and hope it went hope it went really well and thank you everyone for joining us and please uh join us again next week on tuesday night same time and uh tomorrow night we've also got a fascinating talk with pinchas shield from altar boy to judaism that's at 8 p.m so thank you everyone for watching and we appreciate uh bev your time and uh, your enthusiasm i look forward to watching I, have, I wasn't able to watch the talk properly so i look forward to seeing the recording I recorded it. <laughs> it recorded, I promise you. <laughs>